pirates. Who doesn't want to be a pirate? I want to visit a pirate tavern on a dark, stormy night and find a crew that's up for adventure. I want to pick a point on the horizon and explore the vast sea along the way. I want to take my revenge against my mutinous crewmates. Freedom, adventure, danger, and reward on the high seas. Pirates have it all. In 2014, a crew of daring game developers set out on an epic adventure. Come on board for the Sea of Thieves! Players on a pirate ship together in this adventuring world immediately just felt really exciting. To capture the thrills of a pirate's life in one legendary game. Let's create this massive experience that brings players together. Their voyage would see them discover new lands. We're here. It happened. Unexpected treasures. My perception of what Sea of Thieves was shifted when COVID arrived. And stormy seas. We just couldn't get enough servers online. Have we lost this moment for this wonderful game to shine? This is by far the most ambitious game Rare has ever created. How did this game become the most successful new IP for Xbox since the start of the Xbox One generation? You kind of need to let go the way that you would traditionally think about making something. We've, we've got a compass, but we don't have a map. Making any game is difficult. Making new IP is harder. And deliver the pirate fantasy to fleets of passionate fans. I love this game so, so, so much. From every corner of the globe. This is not just a game. This is a community. It means the absolute world to me. Marking five years since the game's launch. Five years? I always thought we'd get to this moment. This is the story of Sea of Thieves. What's he doing? What's he doing, Meg? What are you doing? <laughs> 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 We had recently just finished Connect Sports Rivals. It was just a challenging time. There was a lot of pressure. That was a really kind of refreshing time to be able to just take a break and go, look, you know what, now let's go set what we think the future's going to be. I think our ambition was always see if these would transcend anything we'd done before. We set a team aside to just go and explore ideas. We knew that there was a new game in development. We didn't know what it was, but we really, really passionately wanted to be a part of it. They had ideas for what the game could be, but they're all sort of just on paper. There was nothing tangible that players could play. I guess there's this overall feeling of, we've, we've got a compass, but we don't have a map. We know what we're trying to do. We know roughly what direction we're going, but we've never been there before. I think Rare's always been brave, and I think it's awesome when studios challenge themselves to do something unique. Rare games always have an optimistic creativity to them. That particular like sense of humor that Rare has, their unique kind of sense of joy. They have such a varied history. Everybody has their iconic game. For me, growing up, Rare games represented at their core. Just a wonderful gameplay experience. But Rare hadn't released a new IP in almost a decade. Whatever came next would need to deliver some real punch. Creating new IP, new game ideas, has got to be the hardest thing that there is to do in the game industry. To be at the start of a brand new game at Rare was something I never imagined I'd get the opportunity to do. We knew that the next game we did had to live up to the reputation that this studio has. The pressure was enormous. But really, the thing that you know you can bank on, you know that you can count on, is Rare. There's so many kind of traditional multiplayer games like Team Deathmatch, you know, Free For All, Capture the Flag. Games tended to have the same stories, repeated the same. It was always killing other players or kind of competing against others and feeling more powerful. Or whereas, extreme loss. Yeah, or extreme like loss. Yeah. So as we were interested in, can we have this broad range of stories where our players could come together? When you guys kind of invited us to come and join the team, it was like, right, we'll take you through the idea. And I remember that was written on a whiteboard. It was like players creating stories together. It was less about designers creating scripted scenarios and moments. It was about those moments being created between players. That vision defined the ambition of where we we're going to go. But first, our crew needed to decide what the game would be about. Send in the developers! And we had dinosaurs. <laughs> Next! Werewolves versus vampires. <laughs> Deep sea exploration. Next! 
How do we make it a world that they want to get lost in and escape into? And that's where the idea of pirates came from. <clears throat> Everyone loves pirates. Go on. Players on a pirate ship together, commanding this vessel together in this adventuring world, immediately just felt really exciting. If you think about Pirates of the Caribbean, you think about Treasure Island, you think about the Goonies, these were wonderful touch points for us in terms of the way we wanted the game to feel. I think everyone knows like pirates and the kind of mischief that pirates get up to, that kind of playful mindset, that mischievous kind of nature. It's like going to the pub. You still have, the, you have that kind of fun where you just joke around. And then going to a theme park drunk together with your best mate. Yeah, that's what it feels like. And it wouldn't affect your ability to play the game. It would probably enhance it. Previously, our designers had been in a world where they were very much creative designers, and then the engineering team and, and others were the ones who were bringing those ideas to life. With the prototype for Sea of Thieves, that was very different. The engineers would build a lot of the stuff, and then everyone was just digging in and building it and gluing it together. And we started learning basic modelling and using Unity and prototyping and things like that, and it was so much fun. We didn't have to think about rendering or graphics or input or, or anything like that. This took a lot of the technical weight off our shoulders. So it should be two boats, two crews, explore it as a crew, as you normally would, and then we'll have a feedback session at the end. Hang on a minute! <laughs> got some fire our ship! So the prototype started with this core idea of, is it fun to sail a ship together as a crew? And then it was just a case of, well, where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> It was as easy to start building stuff as it was to start kind of theorising stuff. We've got a rough idea of what's important to us and what's not. Let's actually just start building it and then we'll find out what works and what doesn't. Oh, oh what's all that about? <laughs> the process and that kind of direction at the start was build a small piece of lots of different things in an attempt to try and get as quickly as we could a very broad experience that we could play. We really had this mantra that kind of emerged, which was, you know what, let's just try it and see. And the proof was always in playing it. <laughs> and I think the beauty of the prototype was it was so quick to try stuff. When you want to add a character to the prototype, you can just make it a capsule. And that's what we did. You know, they looked like uh, Tic Tacs. We didn't care about the graphics. We didn't care about the audio. We didn't care about the animation. It was all about the fun and finding the fun. <laughs> We played thousands of hours of this prototype so we could see, you know, the types of things that were sparking that story or sparking that social connection between people. Broken no, that's me. OK, we'll go to that now. Just Zero. don't grab bread and but that, that doesn't, assume it's not there. Yeah, that's that fix isn't favorite. in this build, so don't favorite. do that. That's gone. That's gone. Shelley Preston is my wife. Andy is uh, my husband. And we met as QA testers at Rare back in 2005. We got married during Sea of Thieves. We would live and breathe it, we would work on it all day, we would come home at night, we would talk about it, we'd wake up in the morning excited with ideas. We went on honeymoon to Disney in Orlando and we obviously rode the Pirates of the Caribbean ride with different, you know, kind of fresh perspective of like now we're working on something piratey. They had a kind of riddle trail where they had clues on paper that would send you to the next location. We looked at that and we were like, this is really cool. We need to try and find a way to get this into the game. Well, it's up there somewhere. It's Go to the pointy. Bring <laughs> your back to the thrice marked stone. Did you not put look? Although it is look, look. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Every day there was a new thing to figure out. How are things going to work? How do players respawn on their ship? Like the mermaid's there in, in the game now, but it wasn't the first thing that we tried. We had these like things called like rescue ships. When you got far enough away from your ship, a new ship would like come out of the ocean. Your whole position was kind of given away by all these ships like popping up in the distance. But sometimes you have to go through that process of it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And every time you get a little bit closer to what the right solution is. The beauty of a prototype is it's fun to fail. And we're about to ready to take off. Yep, take off, guys. <laughs> oh, what kind of range of that beauty? I came into Sea of Thieves as already a pirate fan, whereas some people on the team didn't have that same knowledge.
We like level design the, the ship, which was like actually terrible. It was close to like a, a cruise liner or a ferry, but it felt absolutely nothing like a pirate ship. How can I tell them that? Pretty much everything they've done is wrong and we need to start again. <laughs> Greg, Greg was like extremely polite. And the next day he kind of brought in like these books of like pirate ships. And I think they realised that um, actually this is what a pirate ship should look like. And then the next time I saw it, they'd actually built a galleon. We're approaching it from like a gameplay point of view. Oh, well, you would want somewhere. There's no defence of it, Shelley. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's be honest. We did destroy all evidence of it. <laughs> so. Part of the design of when you first step out of the tavern and you see the ship ahead of you, there's no like grand tutorial that says you need to raise the anchor, you need to lower the sails to get going. There's little moments of magic sort of popping as you play. Learning how to interact with this world, like with just you and your crew. You're going to remember that as an amazing story. Fantastic. Oh yeah, treasure! Oh, treasure! Treasure! treasure. treasure. Slacker! Treasure. Yes! Honestly, I felt confident that people were going to love it because everybody that played it fell in love with it and everybody saw that charm. Sailing the seas on your ship with your crew was that kind of, oh my God, we're on something really special here kind of moment. Oh, I'm so clean. Oh, no, they're grabbing us. Quilly, I'm in. Oh, oh their ship's on fire. Yes, success. Oh, no, we're good. running away. <laughs> One of my team shot the other one in the back of the head, nicked all their stuff and cashed it in to his great delight. I ended up with a, a couple of engineers not on speaking terms for a few days. We were trying to find a visual style, a visual kind of look for what it, what it needed to be. We knew we wanted to make something that was charming and, and invoke that playfulness in our players. One of the key things that gives us our art style, we wanted a, a nice, simplified look, but we didn't want it to be overly clean. If you look at our concept work, it has painting brush marks within it, and so we wanted to capture that within the actual kind of models themselves. The defining word for the Sea of Thieves art style is wonky. Wonky TM is, is the trademark. Yeah, wonky. Wonky in Sea of Thieves. It's a key part of the art style. It's one of our, our key pillars. Like, everything feels like there's a history, it's, it's slightly worn. This kind of ramshackle kind of look to it, like parts were made out of ship parts and it was kind of like hastily put together. Or a pirate's face, they've got a wonky nose or an askew chin because they've been in lots of fights or they've kind of been at sea a long time. They've got dinks and dents and I think that's just what makes the characters kind of lovable in that sense. It doesn't feel like that uncanny valley kind of like, you know, this is a perfect Disney princess. It's a bit grittier than that. It's, it's kind of real. It's about kind of accentuating those, those features to them and uh, making them look unique. We have a level of charm, which is to do with our stylized look. And that's something that, you know, is the core identity of CFTs and a lot of Rare games. Early into prototyping, our intrepid crew were convinced they had a game that could find its sea legs to stand among the legends of Rare. But first, they had to convince the leadership team at Xbox. We created our own video saying what inspired us to make a pirate game. I want to explore lost islands and hunt for buried treasure. I want to hide out in, a, in an island cove and ambush passing crews. Oh. The uniqueness of the concept mean we needed to come up with a different way to pitch it. When we did the full pitch to Phil Spencer and Kudo Sonoda and some of the other leadership team within Xbox, they had no idea what we were doing. We'd purposely kept it secret from them. It was really important that we were able to demonstrate our love for the game and how fun the prototype was. So we got to the end of this presentation and then said, oh, and by the way, you're now going to play it. And they were like, what? It was basically the whole game, but just with rubbish graphics. <laughs> Right away, the game was fun, even at the earliest of stages. You could be the pirate that you wanted to be, you could play in the way that you wanted to play. Certain members of our leadership team who will go unnamed, Kudo, became like the self-sabotage. I came into the industry as a tester, so I like going in and trying to figure out how to break things. So I just did everything I could to push the group off the given path to see how the game would react. And so very quickly, people were able to play the game and just get an idea of what it was gonna be like. Across multiple sessions, Rare used the prototype to build excitement within Xbox. None of the players know that they're going to be in the same world together, so we're all rushing to try and get them in and get the game started so they don't see each other's names in the lobby before we press start. They're leaving now. 
I enjoy the grog. That's good stuff. I gotta change the sails. Run up top so you're steering the ship. What can I hit people with? Uh, you've got a sword already, so. How you're... about raw chicken? Yeah, you can hit him with raw chicken. You can hit him with anything. I lost my cutlass. Hold on, no! That's the island They're right in front of us. We had Andy Preston, who was our lead designer, was the kind of guide in the crew. We had the playable gameplay prototype, which was very rough looking. And then we had this art diorama. So you could kind of look at both and go, imagine playing that with it looking like that. And it was like, incredibly exciting. It's like, man, when those two merge eventually, that's just going to be this incredible experience. Uh, can I kill him with the chicken? Yeah, yeah. I'm hiding in a barrel. Do you guys hear me? The other ship is approaching now. Oh. Get back to the ship. Everyone get back to the ship. Oh my god, you died. I don't know what happened. What the hell? Hey guys, let's go close and board them. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> you kids? Why can't we all just get along? You just hit me with a chicken. Total accident. Put the ladder down. Edo, get on board. North. Oh! <laughs> Look at all of you. <laughs> Pretty amazing moment we took out their ship. Whose yeah, ship yeah, that was Did you see that mask? It just went. We couldn't have hoped for it to play out any better. Afterwards, they couldn't stop talking. Like We were trying to get into the next part of the pitch and everything, but they were just chatting, sharing stories all over lunch, and it was just proof of just the whole concept in action. I admire Joe's bravery on that one, to throw them into the deep end and get them to play. We'd never done something like that before at Rare. There was no better tool than playing it firsthand to kind of truly understand what that game's about. It's like I felt amazed when I saw the ship's mask just blow off of the cannon. That was awesome! Oh my god, it was so good! I was sad when I was abandoned by half of my crew. Oh no. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. We had a wheel of emotions, and we'd ask people at the end of a session to write what happened and put them where they made them feel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with uh, rage on killing my mate with the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and you have these moments of serenity and moments of action and moments of sadness and moments of elation. Try and make sure we were getting a good coverage over all of the wheel of emotion, and that informed the gameplay that we added into the game. It was just pretty clear during that playtest session that it was something special. The more that you personalize your gameplay, around what you like to do and what kind of person or pirate you would want to be, the more fun the game became. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, true believer in this one. This is going to be awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With approval from Xbox, the crew weighed anchor and set their sights on their next challenge, announcing their new game to the world at E3 2015. E3 is the uh, Electronics Entertainment Expo. Everyone comes together to show off the latest and greatest games. And if you're going to announce a game, E3 is the perfect stage to do it. But with E3 on the horizon, the game still didn't have a name. There was one name that we've all liked since the start. What's your one nomination then for the, uh, for the top five? No What's treasure first? for the dead. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could call the game something else. You could yeah. call it Pirates. Basic. Uh, no treasure for the dead. No treasure for the dead. See, I even forgot yeah. it as well, which is, no, uh, that's not a good sign. I think we should go back to Romancing the Sea. Yeah. <laughs> romancing the Sea. Romancing the Kraken. <laughs> We are writing down some keywords that we like on a post-it note, folding it over and then coming up with our winning game there. It's <laughs> 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 pretty good! <laughs> Massive ocean, distant hat. <laughs> So, Pirate's Code, Mutiny, Skull and Bones, No Treasure for the Dead, and... Sea of Thieves I liked the first time I heard it. It was bold, it was different. I just think it had something special about it. It captured the world yeah. and your place in yeah, it. Yeah. For me, it's like that whole choose your own adventure. It sounds yeah, like one of those old yeah, books, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was just as soon as you saw it, it was that's like, that's it. it, like that that's is it. So right. cool. mm -hmm. Yeah.
500 of our biggest fans who were sleeping overnight to get tickets to our briefing. As fans waited for the show to start, studio head Craig Duncan was preparing backstage. As we were sort of approaching E3 2015, there was an idea and a trailer that was made that was fully CG, that was very cinematic and looked amazing. But it wasn't what we really wanted to do because we wanted to make sure that our first debut of showing this game was the experience that the player was eventually going to have. How can we take a game like Sea of Thieves to something like E3? We knew we hadn't got the luxury of people coming onto the Microsoft stand and playing the game for hours to understand what it was going to be. The E3 2015 trailer became this short walkthrough, but all done in game. This has to be real. This has to be someone playing the game. I would be literally sitting with the controller in my hands and we'd walk through the build, trying to get the pacing correct. There's lots of games that come out with cinematic trailers. When you actually go out with raw gameplay, there's also an element of respect from gamers out there. You know, they say, well, at least I got to see the actual game. As I'm literally about to step on stage, I'm like, holy crap, like there's now 5,000 people in the room and 10 million people watching live online. Two thousand and fifteen marks the thirtieth anniversary of Rare. Today I'm proud to give you a first look at a new exclusive game from Rare. Set in a fantastical world, this game will bring players together and give them the freedom to play with limitless possibilities. This is by far the most ambitious game Rare has ever created. The rest of the team was kind of at Rare, watching it on the canteen. Halfway through, the feed kind of cut out. No! And then it, it suddenly quickly came back up and everyone kind of, you know, a sigh of relief. reaction in the room was incredible. My phone was going crazy. You can feel the reactions of you announcing something literally a minute after you do it. You're putting yourself out there as a team. You know, here's what we're made of, here's what we're all about. And you're just hoping that that resonates with people. 2015 E3 trailer drops. I think I must have watched it maybe seven or eight times or even more. I was just shocked. I had no idea, no idea they were going to be making a pirate game like this. I just remember thinking like, there's no way this game exists. Like how? This looks amazing. As soon as I saw it, I was completely obsessed. First reaction, oh my God, this is going to be a great game. It's the game we've all been waiting for. Meanwhile, back at Rare. While the team's always had a fondness for pirates, we really wanted them to understand what it means to be a pirate. So we decided to hire a pair of consultants. <laughs> the studio slowly transformed in those early days. And when we were working on the prototype, I remember driving around every fancy dress store, purchasing as much fancy dress stuff as I could get our first pirate gear, bringing it back to the studio. I was a commander. No, I've got nothing. Just me and the grog. Oh. I expensed £200 worth of gold chocolate coins from eBay. That triggered a, a worldwide fraud investigation at Microsoft because I claimed for it using the wrong claim code. I'm finding pirate hats and pirate coats, and Greg started writing pirate names for every single person that came in and played the game. Uh, we have a, a one, one new pirate joining us this week. We have uh, Cheat Daniels. Quite often, the most notorious pirates would be given nicknames. My pirate name is Vicious Vic, and it's badass. I love it. I am the Vile Vincent. Bill Drat Beanland. Grog Swillin Dillon. Devil's Kiss Davis. Filthy Rich Simmons. Dirty McMurtry. That's me. But there was, there was a couple of people that didn't like their names that much. Yeah, so my pirate name's Horf of the North. Um, thanks, Greg. I'm not actually from the North, um, so, but you know, it rhymes, so there we go. <laughs> my pirate name is The Damned Park. 
I didn't choose that. There's always an opportunity to put some artwork on the wall. The corridor's filled with artwork, which is from the team itself. We had wooden panelled flooring. We built big statues that we could have everywhere. From the game through to everything we do, we try to make everything feel like it's Sea of Thieves. Hush now, you sea urchin, just take it to the Lord. We had a lot of fun for a week or two, uh, basically pulling in a bunch of people from around the studio that wanted to voice act. He wants them chess. Unearth the found and stole Just give them up and then you'll see Pirate legend make a thief Now set sail for destiny Oh hail the pirate lord I think we naively thought it was going to be relatively straightforward. It felt like we'd done all the hard work. The prototype had got all these features and we had a really good understanding of what we wanted the game to be. So we thought all we've got to do is take what we've got in the prototype from Unity and put it in Unreal. Like, how hard can that be? Created in the game engine Unity, the prototype for Sea of Thieves was designed for speed. But to create a game that could be shipped to millions of players, our crew had to completely rebuild everything from scratch in a new game engine, Unreal. Everything has to be able to work between multiple players in a, across a network, has to be able to be um, performant in a massively shared world rather than a little small experience that the prototype was playing out in. And it allowed us to go a bit slower, a bit more methodically in Unreal, building it for a mass audience, building it where we can take it to scale. As the Unreal build took shape, the game started to look truly beautiful. But translating the work they'd done in the prototype brought new challenges. The water physics in the Unity prototype were like disgracefully bad. It was like terrible. It was just like a sine wave ocean. And it felt amazing to play. It feels like Sea of Thieves now. And then when we got into Unreal, all of the amazing engineers on the engine team just had created this like phenomenal looking water. And you kind of look and you're like, oh my God, is that going to work on an Xbox? It looks like insane. It's so good. And then we got the ship on it, and the ship was just like, da -da 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 -da, like just bouncing around and kind of reacting to every little kind of nuance. And we can't have that. So we ported that kind of premise over where the ship's physics would follow this like really soft and gentle sine wave. And then we had this like noise filter that would go over that sine wave, which gave you all the kind of beautiful visuals of the water, but that had no effect on the ship's buoyancy or handling in any way. How do you render things that look painterly rather than things that look painted on? If you start, you know, drawing brush strokes on all of your texture maps, it kind of looks like someone has gone and painted on everything, but it doesn't look like a painting of these objects. They look like objects that have been painted. We've always tried to push more and more VFX in areas, so the environment. We had VFX to characters, we had VFX to cutscenes, we had VFX to animations, emotes, cannon muzzles. The VFX still needs to feel grounded and real, but then the magical elements that we put on top of that then can be a bit more elaborate. What we typically do when we're keyframe animation is we're starting from scratch, figuring out how these characters act, you know, what they're going to do, what they're going to say. We film ourselves acting it out, and then we use the reference as a basis to animate. I think um, when people walk past us and see us, they, they think we're crazy. <laughs> they think we're crazy people. We do put a lot of time, attention and love into making sure that the soundscape feels inviting, uh, that nothing feels too oppressive or too invasive in terms of the mix. The team decided that the music should support the player experience, not lead it. You've got these sort of pockets of music throughout the game, and it's almost like the, the player is the arranger of the score. They could decide to go, I'm just going to sail over here now, or I'm going to get the fishing rod out, or I'm going to play a shanty. We scale the battle music right back to the moment that your cannonball hit another ship. If you slap on battle music, you're inferring that they should battle each other. If you fire a cannonball and you hit another ship, you will get a sting to say, da-da-da-da, you've successfully landed a shot, so that it wasn't trying to sort of push a player down a certain path. So I think the, the beautiful artwork, the beautiful water, the beautiful audio and music, all of those things go to create a nice space to just exist in. When I play Sea of Thieves and I come across other people, most of the time, if they're not trying to shoot me, we end up getting drunk and playing music together. You can play the concertina and another person will join with the banjo and you'll play the same song and the backing and the lead parts will actually change so that it actually feels like you're playing as part of a band, so you're not just overlapping on each other. 
That was kind of the approach we took with it. What would a pirate orchestra sound like? Things are squeaky, they're creaky, nothing quite feels like it's polished. These are gnarly pirates, so if they get the odd note wrong, it really doesn't matter. In fact, that's better. It's just got to be a little bit warts and all. John and Robin actually went to a shop which sells these very vintage, these very old second-hand instruments. Went over and just tried different instruments out and see what they had there. One thing they did have was a massive glass cabinet full of concertinas. We kind of were playing all the nice ones and the guy in the shop was like, oh, this one's beautiful, this one's beautiful. We just sort of like play a few notes and go, yeah, it's okay, it sounds a bit nice, it sounds a bit clean. And then at the back there was just this one that was just looked a bit more kind of beaten up. Played it and it just pop to us, it's like, that's the pirate one. That's it, that's perfect, that's the instrument for us. And the guy in the shop was just looking at us like, how can you want the really rubbish one? These ones are all really good. We're like, no, this one's really perfect. I found a hurdy-gurdy and sort of just cranked the wheel and it was the most horrendous sound. It was just like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this. I felt really sort of a little bit sick. It does take some time to get used to it. To be completely honest, we play it in bits and then we kind of like stick it together. <laughs> That's the secret. If you go back to the early days of Rare, the mantra was keep everything secret. We want everything a surprise. By the time we hit the early days of Sea of Thieves, things were really beginning to shift. What started as me just walking around a lot of the corridors here and filming meetings and filming play tests, then turned into, okay, we needed to expand the, the video team. Cheers! Ahoy there! The team built a tavern to film developer updates and high jinks on the high seas. We wanted this relationship with our players. We wanted this one-to-one wow. -one communication. Get in front of the camera as often as possible to tell a story of how the game was evolving and what was coming next. <laughs> Bloody marvellous. Oh hi, it's John Vincent from Rare, and I'm giving you, yes, you, the opportunity to be the first person in the world to play Sea of Thieves. That's right, I'm giving away all expenses paid trips to England to visit legendary Studio Rare. We ran a competition to be the first in the world to play Sea of Thieves. We invited people from all over the world to submit anything really creative to say why they think they should be first in the world to play the game. And we had just like a myriad of different amazing creative applications. Poems, short films, some 3D animation. We asked you to show us how excited you were for Sea of Thieves. You delivered. Let's meet the lucky winners who will visit us here at Rare. We were playing it and we were having all this amazing time, but, you know, no one from the outside world had, had seen it. When you hand that world over to players, you're going to see things you didn't expect. That input was absolutely invaluable in kind of honing the core of what made Sea of Thieves special. It was a bit of a gamble because it could have backfired on us. It could have like, just not worked, but fortunately, it did work out the way we wanted to. Hi, everybody. Here we are. We're sailing. Just watching them take their first kind of steps into Sea of Thieves as a world, it was really magical. <laughs> are, we, are we emptying it? <laughs> usually walk a straighter line than this. It just wrote itself. Just the adventures just came out and people were laughing and screaming and shouting. Go, go to the boat, go to the boat. Oh my God, you're leaving me behind. No! <laughs> we're screwed. It was a triumph. And with the developers seeing fans experience the game the way that they had hoped, it was time to bring Sea of Thieves to the show floor at E3 2016. But first, Rare had a huge surprise. Three weeks ago, we invited some of our awesome Sea of Thieves community to Rare to be the first players in the world to play our game. This is their story. Here I am seated in the theater, and there we are, popping up on the screen. There's a ship to the left, to the left. Oh my god. They're going down, yeah! Woo! <laughs> Let's go! I just remember that moment of standing there, watching them sort of realizing, oh my god, like, this is us. This is our experience of playing this game. We're just like shaking each other like, what? Like, look at this, this is unbelievable. It was an out-of-body experience and one I will probably never quite experience again. We decided we were gonna go on the show floor. 
But the dev team decided we were going to man the stands ourselves. We were going to organise people coming on, we were going to give them t-shirts, we were going to actually play the game with them. It just escalated so quickly. At the end of the day, our queue was about three hours long just to play this game, and we actually had to close the queue. The love that they had for that little tiny bite of an experience was so energising. We had such a diverse number of individuals come through the booths. I am a gamer without sight. I have absolutely no sight whatsoever. So I go on, I play the game, and it ends up working really well, just being told roughly where to steer. And we ended up navigating through the middle of a giant fight on the server between other ships, which was amazing. The fact that someone who can't see can play the game and have fun, it was just really heartwarming and just really validating to see. As we ran up to launch, we had this set of technical alphas where we would release update videos and to try and encourage people to come into our insider program to play the game. It was time to cast the net wide and invite thousands of players into the game's insider program to find out what the community would do with the tools that they were given. We got first-hand feedback for the first time, what features resonated. We would increase the amount of players every time that we did it. We were sort of doubling it every single time. At every step of the way, you find out kind of where's the next bottleneck. That was the first time we had people playing at home. It was also a way of us checking that what we built was stable so that when the game did launch, we were going to be ready. When you embark on a treasure quest in this technical alpha build, you'll have a map to get you sailing in the right direction. In this case, a classic X marks the spot style map. It was just so exciting just to play it. No pun intended, but it was pretty bare bones, you know. <laughs> That was a huge new thing for us and it was an amazing decision to do that because it helped ultimately shape what Sea of Thieves became. I think I had spent eight hours that night playing. It was a very unique experience and what I really liked is how much teamwork you need to be efficient in the game. And we could see that appetite, especially from creators, to actually go out there and show the world what they were playing. When we launched the, the beta, um, where we allowed people to finally stream the game, it just blew up. What really mattered was that first version of the game. That is what Sea of Thieves would be to players. As we're getting closer to launch, we're trying to get things done quicker, there's more changes going in, like it's just, you're at the height of chaos. Making any game is difficult, making new IP is harder. There's nothing to kind of look at and go, yeah, we're that, it's just new. As a design team, we started out with just the four of us, with myself and Andy and Greg and Mike. When we transitioned into Unreal, we started to kind of divide and conquer. You're less involved in absolutely everything about one thing, but there's a real greatness to that because it means we can collectively do more. The way we developed Sea of Thieves, we have everything behind feature toggles. The run-up to launch, we were looking at the amount of features that were hidden behind toggles and it was just unachievable. There's a certain amount of processing power. Every single thing we add eats into that. If we use up all that processing power, the whole experience begins to degrade. And if it runs out of memory, it just crashes dead. There was so much stuff that we'd built and proven out in the prototype. So we knew we were going to launch without everything. And that was hard. There was definitely a sense of reality creeping in, in a way. What is our best foot forward. Mm. What needs to be in the first version of the game? Losing features is always difficult, especially when it's a feature that you're really passionate about. We didn't get um, any of the ship fire in, and that was something that we loved. When your ship would set fire and then it would spread and all this kind of chaos that it would create. Cannonballs rolling around on the deck. That was clearly gonna be a complete nightmare. The volcanoes not having it for launch, it was like, oh! The biggest one, it was on the chopping block for a long, long time, was the Kraken. We weren't sure how it was going to work. We weren't sure it was going to look visually great. And it's got animated arms waving around, but it also wraps its arm around the ship and kind of shakes it around. And that was on a knife edge for so long, and we almost lost it. I was so pleased when that finally made the cut, and it was right there in that launch trailer.
this is what Xbox is all about. Like the game you would want to lead with is Sea of Thieves. We knew that it was a game that was going to stand up well, really resonate with the community, would lend itself well to streamers. It was just sort of a natural progression then to put it into Game Pass. By being one of the first releases on the new subscription service, Xbox Game Pass, Sea of Thieves would be available day one to a significantly larger audience. Which meant that all of a sudden, like millions more people would have access to Sea of Thieves. A few more millions more than what we were anticipating. So it was quite a shock for the team. We are launching one of the biggest games that we've ever created. And it was almost like this live or die moment. The white knuckle moment was, okay, how many of these millions of players are gonna come in and play? Um, and do the servers stay up? I think on launch day, we turned on something like 35 toggles that had never, ever been turned on in the game before. And so that was a edge of your seat moment, turning them all on and saying, right, let's see what happens. <laughs> So good, the water looks so good. We got this, baby! Oh, oh god, dang it! What the heck? <laughs> what was that? Oh, shit, going down? I died immediately. Oh, oh, my god. oh no! <laughs> There's so many! Bail the ship! Bail the ship! Bail the ship! Oh, 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 what? what? Me game crashed. Why is it unable to look? What? We lost the internet on the great oh, sheet. No, this my game crashed. What the frick? Just how the fucking servers are. Why is it not filled with content? The servers don't fucking work. I'm so disappointed right now. Is that it? Is that really it? Sea of Thieves has, like, no content. Dive into the frothy waters of the Sea of Thieves and discover that they're about as deep as an inflatable kiddie pool as you scour the high seas for adventure, booty, and any trace of fun. The game was awash with complaints of technical issues, crashes, and when players could play, a general lack of content. It's definitely not a great game. I don't think it'll be a game that'll be very fondly remembered. Six months from now, is there even gonna be people playing this game? I don't know. I think time will tell when it comes to this. We all knew that it wasn't the game we felt it could be. I think we kind of knew that we'd fallen short in terms of the scope of that world, the depth the different things that you could do. There was definitely a dark period just before launch and just after where it felt like if we lost this moment for this wonderful game to shine that we'd fallen in love with. Riding the wave of seeing the feedback, seeing the laughing and joking on, on the streams and seeing how it's like resonating with our players, that wave started to dissipate a little bit and some of the other like the technical issues started to come through. We were already past the highest load that we'd achieved in all of the tech alphas and it was accelerating fast. We had the best and worst problem in the world, which is lots of people turned up. Our biggest scale test up to that point had been tens of thousands of people and day one, hundreds of thousands of people turned up. The first two, three days, we kind of put out about 40 patches to services to kind of adjust how we were coping with the load. We felt this was a good opportunity to get out in front of you as, as people that have supported us, our community, our players, uh, and really talk to you about what some of those issues are. It became a little bit of a trope, um, you know, in some of those early days, having a, a slightly kind of ashen-faced Joe and Craig standing in front of our audience on video saying like, hey, Here's what we know is wrong, we hear you loud and clear. Here's what we're gonna go put right. We do appreciate all the patience, we do appreciate the support. Um, believe me, it is frustrating for us as it is for anyone that's experiencing an issue. We were almost a victim of our own success. We had so many people hearing about the game and wanting to play it that we just couldn't get enough servers online at the time. And so lots of people were experiencing, I've bought this game and I can't get into it because there's, the, the demand's too high. This was really the first live service game that we'd launched. First real kind of AAA multiplayer shared world sandbox. And with that, obviously the team were amazing and they'd scaled to really match everything that was asked of them up until launch where it was very overwhelming. The way that some people on the internet speak to each other isn't nice. But a lot of things you can take to heart, especially when it's directed towards you. You sometimes forget that there is literally a team of 200 human beings behind it all. When you have then someone say like, oh, this game's trash, <laughs> like, you know, that genuinely does hurt. There's a lot of reviews of people saying like, game's fun, doesn't have content. There was always that need for more 
I want more. <laughs> Give me more. I don't know. I, most of Sea of Thieves to me is about making your own stories. So I had no problems finding things to go do and taking advantage of all the tools that were, that were there. You know, it's not the worst game ever. It's just a disappointment in the current state. It's got these insanely fun bursts of, of dynamic gameplay that really make you feel like a real life pirate. There wasn't a lot to experience in this, and it, that kind of bums me out, but like, it, it's an awesome idea. I feel like I like barely touched the surface but it has so much potential to grow and become so much more than it already is. This game is one of a kind, and it has huge shortcomings. But I'm gonna be honest, I, I had fun! That first year was about having a point to prove, basically. Yeah. Like, we know we've got a strong foundation, but how can we give our players what they're looking for? Mm -hmm. And the roadmap we initially had, and how we thought we were gonna grow the game, we threw that out the window, didn't Everybody we? Everybody has a plan until they get punched yeah. in the face. <laughs> We had to work pretty hard to counter the narrative. Well, this is lovely, where's the rest of it? Sea of Thieves was Rare's first live service game, which means that unlike traditional games, which only release once, it would have the opportunity to evolve with its community and engage fans with new content and gameplay. The waves of change roll throughout the seas. You kind of need to let go the way that you would traditionally think about making something. You would make it absolutely perfect and then it goes and then you move on to something else where Sea of Thieves was nothing like that. It's a living, breathing kind of product that changes all the time. So it, it was a real kind of like, if you give the term, sea change in how we thought about delivery. That first year, so it was the Meg, the Skelly Ships, kind of Devil's Roar, yeah. Shrouded Spoils yeah. and then Anniversary. It was never about one specific feature that was going to carry it. And some of those were things that we'd prototyped before and we could just bring it along and put it into the game. And some of them were like completely new things that we'd never done before. For the first sort of six months, we released every week and releasing every week meant that we could respond very quickly to feedback. We'd actually basically run out of memory and run out of, of processing power the day we launched it. Every single thing we've added since then we've had to go back and try and find more memory and more processing power to be able to fit the new stuff in. We're always looking for new exciting ways to free things up so the designers can go wild with the next update and put a, a bunch of new shiny stuff in. This included new voyages. The hunger in deep. The first time crews would ever combine and work together. New foes to vanquish. Since day one, I always wanted to fight like a monster, like a creature. Let's build a megalodon. Let's create this massive experience that brings players together. More items to interact with. How did I live before there were harpoons? New regions to explore. Devil's Roar is designed to be a more dangerous area. There's less resources. Most of the islands have volcanoes on them. And fishing? Fish, fishing? That was what? Fishing? Is that really what you want? I was like, let me fish. Because people just enjoy spending time in the game. They just go out and just go fishing, just for fun. And while some fans were happy just fishing, others were a bit more demanding. We wanted other food. We've had enough potassium. This is too much potassium. I really wanted to name our ship. I wanted to have our own ship as a crew where we could decorate it and you know make it our own. Just like if players want something, we will see it in some capacity. We have one person who keeps asking for an owl in the game. Anybody who knows me in real life knows that I love owls. Every day I would post a daily request for rare to add owl pets into Sea of Thieves. I did a daily request holding an actual owl at one point. While owls were sadly absent, an update to bring pets to the game was already being worked on, and Rare knew just how they wanted to announce it. And I get this random email really late at night from Joni saying, hey, wouldn't it be amazing if we got a live monkey on the stream? Welcome to the Pets and Pirate Emporium preview stream. Next day, we get back and I'm like, yes, we've got a monkey. Um, what could go wrong? Well. The ones that come out of the water. Right? Yeah, they yeah, spawned yeah. up alongside a ship and attacked you instantly. <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> Turn the camera. That, that is what we expected to happen, to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs>
It's a little bit on your face. Is it? Yeah. The anniversary update was huge. It did sort of revive the game. So it was exactly what everyone was craving. It was beautiful. It was, it was really, really a magical time. Narrative content in the game for the first time, that was something we'd never prototyped before. Now this is what I like to see. A grand adventure, a fight to the death, and a great big pile of treasure. As part of the anniversary release, we released Tall Tales. And Tall Tales was our first foray into telling a series of stories within the world of Sea of Thieves. We had a quest book and some, some logic puzzles to try and sell through all nine of those Tall Tales. We tried to put puzzles in that would encourage crew members to, to work together and make everyone feel involved that were really hard to solve without other crew members. It's not about the goal. It's about the glory. And for pirates who cared less about exploring a sandbox and more about player versus player combat, a whole new game mode was added. The arena. PvP in Sea of Thieves is an incredible part of the game. It's one of my favorite things to do. When arena first came out, that's when it was thriving. It was so much fun. It's official. Sea of Thieves has become a bona fide franchise that Xbox can hang their hats on. It's amazing what a year of development support can do to a game, especially from an amazing developer that has passion for the project they're working on. You have a completely different game that a lot of people really should give another shot. Anniversary was a real turning point for the community and for the developers who loved seeing the wacky ways that they were interacting with the tools that they've been given. There's so many examples of mechanics that we added. We could never predict how players would use those tools. One of the things I love so much about Rare is their, their stance is tools, not rules. So here's a tool, use it however you want, and they make sure it's balanced, or at least they try. We have done so much weird stuff, killing the gold hoarder with snakes only. Using the lanterns and communicating from the ship to the islands, using Morse code. Our community is super creative. We found a way to take a mega keg and a harpoon rowboat and launch that thing to ships like a keg catapult or something. And it worked. <laughs> it was the most ridiculous thing that we've ever done. <laughs> yes! We have these things called player immortalizations. You'll see it littered throughout Sea of Thieves. There's different things that kind of mark maybe the first person to fall off a cliff. The first person who died on the Ferry of the Damned. The most pirates slain during the Techno Alpha. So, you know, and they're like on a wanted poster, this really feared pirate slayer. When the game launched, we thought it would be cool to sort of make like really rare Sea of Thieves controllers. No way, no way. No we, way. Should, uh, we should get Oh my one. God! Holy cow, check it out! So what Rare had done is they actually put this as an Easter egg inside the game, you know? To be inside of a game is, is quite legendary, you know? You can see how much love and care is put into the game, and I think the community and the players are a reflection of that, of the love and how much work and dedication they put into it. I'm getting choked up. <laughs> Sea of Thieves is extra special for me because I am playing it with my wife. She never played video games before, and so that's just really fun to, to share that with her. Without the community, I wouldn't be able to play. Once they've realized, you know, what I can do, what I can't do, what I need help with, it's brilliant. This is the only game I really play where the community is such an integral core pillar of it. I do have a health situation, so I can't really work a normal job through streaming and then getting into Sea of Thieves. It helps me kind of escape my reality when things are tough in life. And you're not gonna keep thinking that you're ill all the time. My youngest brother passed away at 22. Really the only way I could get my, my other brother to talk was to get on and game with him. And he, he introduced me to Sea of Thieves. It gave us a place that wasn't awkward you know, to laugh about things because we were both uh, hurting. Sea of Thieves gave me a lot of purpose in my life. It pushed me to uh, make a podcast. It, it pushed me to hone in on streaming. It, it, it taught me how to create a community and people came. They've changed my life. After some significant changes to its original heading and a year of intense work, Sea of Thieves had built a passionate community 
who'd fallen in love with the world that Rare had created. It finally looked like smooth sailing ahead for the game, the developers, and their burgeoning band of adventurers. I think what was challenging about 2020, you know, we didn't know how long that was going to last. We didn't know how we were going to work. As a, a leader of an organisation, you always think back to experiences you've had before and how can you draw on those. And the pandemic was totally different to all of those. Oh, it was an incredibly surreal time. Wow, everything that we do to run a business, you know, doesn't, you know, it doesn't fly anymore. Before we even think about productivity and what we've got to do, what we've got to ship. It's like, how do we make sure that Rare, people's team, their project, the people they work with is, is safe? So I was in the studio for about two months in person, getting to know people, figuring out what everybody did, where everybody sat, how things worked, and then we would just, everything completely changed. We were a very social focused studio. You know, everyone was always looking over somebody's shoulder, calling somebody over to have a chat. Doing that remotely with, you know, a team of 20 or 30 people was something that, you know, we just didn't know how to do. It was a hard time for people in COVID. Just like this thing that interrupted the whole world, obviously, we all know that. My hubby had leukaemia as well, which didn't help. So we were really um, shut off from everyone. I had a lot of concerns that I'd lose touch with my friends, that I'd come outside and be like, oh, my friends don't remember me anymore. So it was really trapping. It was really like you were just stuck. So what you did instead was you connected through technology, online video games. You, you think this is my first rodeo? My perception of what Sea of Thieves was shifted when COVID arrived. I got their flag, I'm happy about that. Originally it was a game, but it meant so much more to people post-COVID. And there are a lot of people that used it almost like a virtual chat room to just sit on their ship and hang out. I found Sea of Thieves and I found streaming and I found Twitch and that was my release, that was my going out with friends and getting that bit of fresh air. It was a place where I could enjoy something and just be free. You shot me into that, B! Like, it's almost like a distraction simulator, right? Like, where you just go out, you start playing, and then you just get distracted by different quests, messaging bottles, other players. And it was just that opportunity to chat, to laugh, and hear voices and have that human connection. I'm proud to be part of an industry that's able to offer that opportunity for people to connect. It's really brought it home that it's not frivolous at all, you know, that, that people need to be entertained and they need something to do that's outside of the chaos that's around them. And with that came the responsibility of making sure that it matched the expectations of our players. But nobody could have expected what came next. And there was this surreal moment where we were put in touch with the creative team at Disney. <laughs> oh. Wait, wait, what? Is this Pirates of Caribbean? Jack Sparrow, what? Captain Jack Sparrow. We're getting Pirates of the freaking Caribbean? The Pirates Life was our collaboration with Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, and that, like, I still can't believe that when you say those words. One Davy Jones. They basically kept everything for the Pirate's Life on the down low. No one knew what was coming. Like everything you ever want in this game. Magic! And then to actually get to go play it like a week later. Oh! What? Rascals and scoundrels, villains and knaves, drink up, me hearties, yo ho! A toast to piracy and its many shiny rewards. The quote that always stuck with me that they shared in that very first meeting was, we love your game and we could go create a game like that, but why do that when we can just work with you? Inside, I'm kind of exploding at that point. Mike's pitch broadly kind of rested on what, what would happen if Davy Jones discovered our world. Destroy that! 
It was such a dream come true for me personally, having grown up wanting to work at Disney initially, wanting to be a Walt Disney Imagineer, but then the responsibility of, if Jack Sparrow's going to have adventures in the Sea of Thieves world, it needs to be done in an authentic way. And you must have heard tell of my heroic journey to acquire this, the greatest pirate treasure of all. You are in Jack Sparrow's kind of memories through the Sea of the Damned, and part of those memories are what happened in the narrative of the original 1966 ride. It's that kind of notion of being on a theme park ride. It's like you're taking part, so whilst Jack Sparrow's in the game, he's there to assist you, he's part of your crew. The shores of gold. I like the sound of that. Let's go there next. While the crew relished the challenge of staying true to Pirates of the Caribbean, they also had some creative freedom blowing up the actual landmark from the actual Disneyland. There was a problem that we were trying to solve, how to block off a route. In general, the team tends to just build stuff to show these cool ideas off, expecting to get dismissed and thrown out, like we can never do that. There's no way we could ever pitch blowing up a Disney landmark. And Mike turned to me and just went, oh, we've got to do that now. Captain Jack Sparrow, show yourself, you miserable cur. You had this really clear goal, it was so exciting, and it kind of helped distract you from everything else that was going on. I mean, I was homeschooling uh, in one room and then going to the other room to have a call with Disney <laughs> about, yeah. about what we were doing. It was fun getting to work with Shelley on it. That was really cool because we got to kind of work really closely together again, and it's something that I really, really enjoy doing. The hardest update we were ever going to do was done in the hardest circumstances of all just working from home. If we can do that, we can do any update. During those challenging times that like everyone was very kind of supportive, they ha always have been a rare. For me and Andy personally, it was a very difficult time because, you know, Andy's dad, my, my father-in-law sadly passed away during that time. So there was a lot of kind of difficult time in the family and grief and heartbreak. And then some of the last things I spoke to him about was, here's a pirate's life, you know, here's what we're gonna do. Like showing him concept art for like what it's gonna be. And I had that personal kind of pressure on myself to kind of realise that and, you know, not just for players, not just for myself, but like in memory and in honour of him. Sea of Thieves was just one of those games that just hit right for people in lockdown. There's been so many wonderful, wonderful stories that we've heard of people just saying, I'd, I'd have totally lost it. And, but this game kept me sane, kept me alive. Whatever flag you fly, whatever course you chart, I hope that everybody's days are filled with as much camaraderie as mine. We are pirates, yes, but we are people too. All of my friends were still with me and we still got to spend time with each other. It's not normality but it's some semblance of normality, you know, just being around people. It's not the pandemic that brought people together, it's people that brought people together. Even on the worst days, you know, the day my dad passed, I didn't know what to do. So I went to my laptop and then I sent out an hour request because it made me happy. We were due to get married in the summer of 2020 and then COVID happened. So I got the random idea to put it out there that I wanted to get married in the seas and see if there was anything that stuck. The post got passed around the studio, like saying, how can we help out with this? We started up a custom server for them so they could celebrate with their friends. We settled on Smuggler's Bay being our backdrop. We pulled all of the boats into that bay and had them all set up nice and neat and even. Yeah. And then we decorated the entire beach. We had a seating section, we had an altar, we had treasure piled all over the place. I was right in the middle of, of saying our vows. We had a skelly pop up with a keg and I just remember like turning around just running. <laughs> I mean, the whole entire time, everybody was just laughing and having the world's best time. There's never a dull moment on Sea of Thieves. While many of us love to explore every intimate detail of a title through multiple playthroughs, these next nominees have held our attention through consistent updates to their games that manage to engage, delight, and tell a story. And the BAFTA goes to Sea of Thieves. 
Hey everyone, bit weird to be recording this video and not knowing if we won or lost. I remember the three of us actually, we were on a Discord call at the time during the... Watching the... And we were watching it live and um, you know, they were called out Sea of Thieves and we were like banging the table. We were like <laughs> pounding the table, crying. And Joe was like, you're missing like, speech. Listen to my speech, it's yeah. funny. If we have won, amazing. If we haven't, not so amazing, but you won't be seeing this video anyway. But is that like a bear accepting a bathroom in the woods or is it a tree falling in the woods? Pirate's Life was kind of an amazing moment for the game. Since then, we've delivered some of our best updates ever. We brought updates that were free to those who sail the sea, though there's always more potential within. We've added captaincy. We announced it with the, with the song with John McMurtry singing beautifully in it. And as this song will spell out, there's plenty to sing about. Now that you can finally be a captain. We have introduced seasons to the game. With each season comes a whole load of new features. They offer new cosmetics to unlock, new voyage types. We've got shrines, which are these underwater, like, expansive islands. Fireworks, new pirate legend voyages and content. It's really nice as an artist as well because my work is changing all the time. Adventures offer a narrative episode every month. We can rebuild Golden Sands. Oh yeah? And who's gonna rebuild it? You! Players kind of got to decide the fate of Golden Sands. You are responsible for evolving the Sea of Thieves and defending it or trashing it, <laughs> depending on what you choose. We also added sitting. We actually created a stool item. The first forum post that came back was, this stool feature is the stupidest thing Rare have ever made, full stop, and that will forever be a badge of honor for me. If you gather up four stools and decide to sit in a circle and tell each other stories, then that's perhaps one of the most powerful features we could have put in the game. That's massively big headed of me to say. <laughs> Please don't use that. But one feature was no longer right for Sea of Thieves. Retiring the arena was a super difficult decision. You know, a lot of work, a lot of effort went into that. Kind of split the game into like the esporty version of it and the main game. It, it was a fun mode, but it was a side mode. But it's very time intensive and resource intensive. You know, we want Sea of Thieves to feel like Sea of Thieves and not to start getting fractured and separated. I did play arena. I enjoyed it, but then as I played it more, I realized, like, this isn't what brings me back to the game. It was the right decision. Our aspirations were very much focused around adventure, and it was backed up and driven by the fact that that's where our players were. I feel great about Sea of Thieves. There were times when I was worried it wouldn't live up to its potential. It's became an even greater piece of work than what we prototyped. Every time I see players creating a story that we probably never imagined would ever be created, that's when I feel like that's what the vision was supposed to be. The game has garnered this incredible community now. We definitely achieve that goal of players creating stories together. We hear them every day and we all take absolute joy in them as well. We've had the, the privilege of being able to go to lots of events. You get to meet the people who are out there actually playing the game and you get to listen to their stories, come back from those events. Everyone's like, super buzzed because they come back and they can sort of spread that energy back into the team. Sea of Thieves Fest was due to happen in 2020. The world conspired against that, but they managed to pull it off in 2022. Our expectations were just minimal. We had no idea how much of a success it was going to be. We are the Longest Johns. Uh, this is Dave, Robbie, Andy, and my name's JD. They did such a fantastic job last time. You, you'd have guessed it had been going for many years and they'd had loads of experience in it. Loads of people did go from the team and just, I think, were blown away and slightly overwhelmed by it, you know, that there was this love for it. There isn't a community that I've seen out there that is as connected and involved as the Sea of Thieves community. Plan for the Sea of Thieves Fest for this year, bigger and better straight away. We saw what we achieved last year. We've already gone bigger. 800 pirates. All tickets are sold out. It's become more than a game now. People carve their own life adventures from this game.
Rare truly lives up to their name. The heart and soul that they put into the game is felt all the way across. This is not just a game, this is a community, and it's a community where you can meet people that will change your life. I don't want to get emotional. I get emotional. <laughs> With Sea of Thieves and when I started streaming, it actually made me have my first income. I am a full-time content creator now with a decent following on Twitch and on YouTube, and I'm able to do this full-time support my family. Sea of Thieves is the reason I started. They support the creator side of this game in a way that I haven't seen any other developer do. I love this game so, so, so much. It has shaped so much of my career with streaming. It has touched my heart in ways I can't even describe. I never in a million years would have thought that I would have met the person I was going to spend the rest of my life with on a video game. I really enjoy sailing with our girls. They're 11 and 12 now. They sail the seas with us. I have two daughters. They're in their 20s now. It becomes just a place where a family that's not all living under the same roof anymore can still have those nice moments together. Sea of Thieves has been such a huge, huge part of my life. It means the absolute world to me to be able to be part of a community that can help shape a game, that can help create a world. Oh, I bid farewell to... Starting Sea of Thieves felt like the start of a new era for Rare. Working on such an ambitious game, it's a dream come true on so many levels. There's something lightning in a bottle about Sea of Thieves that you can't quite put your finger on, but it was just the right people at the right time with the right idea. But as we went through lockdown and everything since, we've seen how much games in general really mean to people. And I think that's the, you know, that's the course we're charting with Rare. Rare create games the world doesn't have. There is nothing like Sea of Thieves. There is nothing like the way you feel when you play Sea of Thieves. You know, a unique style, but also a style that can last for so long. You know, the art team, the game team, the engine and rendering teams, they've been what's let Sea of Thieves carry on going for this long and will let it carry on going for many more years in the future. People care about this game like more than a lot of people care about their games. It's a privilege to be able to say, we're trying to make it better every single day. Five years since release, and that's a huge amount of time, but, but we've done so much within it, but it honestly feels like a blur. That's the exciting thing with Sea of Thieves, right? We've still got so many ideas, so much potential, so many opportunities, that what's next is that we keep making content for the game, we keep going from strength to strength and we keep building on this core and this magical experience. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? That I don't think the game will ever be done. And I think it's been the voyage of a lifetime <laughs> to get to this point. In many ways, where the story just begins. <laughs> I've heard you say that every year. <laughs> I'll, be saying it in 20, I'll be saying it in 20 years' still time. Saying it. Still That's saying it. It's true. All right, let's hoist up the thing, everybody. Out of college with grey straight from hell I browse for a trade in which I could excel An ad for a ship in need of some manning Men sail some purpose but lacking a captain What luck says I to find such good fortune Few white lies later I ran down the pier Bought me a coat and a cutlass or two Jumped on the deck and I yelled at the crew I stopped the thing Back down the what's it What's that thing spinning? Somebody should stop it Turn out to port Hi. Hi, Jared. Hi. You're right. <laughs> Hi, it's me, the one you forced to see notifications about our requests every day. <laughs> we will be adding owl pets to Sea of Thieves. Will you really? At some point. At some <laughs> We will. There, we will. There is, there is concept art. I can show you concept art. Do you want to see concept art? I would love to see concept art. <laughs> It's going to be janky because I don't know if I can share my screen. Um, so you're going to get webcam of my screen. Look at this fella. Oh! <laughs> and there's its butt. <laughs> this is, you know, owl whip, owl work in progress. So, owl pets are coming. What's that thing spinning? Somebody should stop it. Turn out to port. Well, that's not port. Now I've got it. Trust me, I'm in control. Hey! I stop the thing. Back down 